I, I like DeSantis. I wish he would run for president. I think now's his time. I think he has what it takes. I think he could take this country uh, in, towards a, a fundamentally new and, and better direction. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello. This week I am joined from across the pond by Chris Rufo, writer, filmmaker, political activist, member of the Manhattan Institute and commando in the culture war. He's done more than many to highlight the insidious nature of critical race theory being taught in American schools and now gender ideology. He's also an advisor and a policy advisor to possible future presidential candidate Ron DeSantis. So without further ado, Chris Rufo, thank you for joining me. It's good to be with you. Um, Chris, I'm just going to start with a question that, I, uh, that is bothering me on a daily basis. Is this the end of the West or the beginning of the fight back? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm more partial to the, to the latter. I think it's the beginning of a fight back. You see the West and, and the Western countries and civilizations always going through an ebb and flow. And so it may feel like we're uh, in, in a bit of a downturn at, at some risk. Uh, but the fundamentals are still strong. We have, uh, I think, a lot ahead of us. Uh, so I, I think I'm at heart fundamentally optimistic. Good, me too. Um, so I want to talk to you about grooming as well, because in the UK, grooming, which has now been banned off the internet, I hear from Twitter and Facebook and various, because we finally found a word on the other side of the argument that accurately describes what's being done to our children. Uh, in the, in England, grooming is predominantly associated with uh, what we call grooming gangs, which are mainly Pakistani men who exploit young white women and uh, systemically rape them and have been doing so for years and no one has reported it as a result of uh, fear of being called a racist which is the ultimate weapon that comes from the left uh, whenever we say anything they disagree with. Um, could you explain to me uh, the, the rise in the popularity, where, where the word groomer came from in uh, America and why, why the left particularly are so frightened of it? Sure. I, I don't know actually the etymology if you go way back, but in the recent moment and the kind of discourse that we have, uh, I think I trace it back actually to James Lindsay or Conceptual James on Twitter. Uh, he was the first person to really go after it and using the word groomer or grooming from my perspective, I think the word grooming is an important word. It's an accurate word, but you have to be careful in, in, in deploying it uh, uh, responsibly, but also understanding that it has a range of meanings. So one could be groomed into an ideology, like a cult grooming or an ideological grooming. One can be groomed into an identity. Um, we have in this new gender ideology, this constantly morphing uh, group of, of neo identities. And so one can be certainly influenced and encouraged and and manipulated into adopting a, a, a one of these synthetic sexual identities. And then finally, of course, uh, as as with the grooming gangs, one can be groomed for actual physical abuse. That's the most rare form. It's the most extreme form. It's at the top of that pyramid, definitional pyramid. Um, but all of these things are certainly happening. We have the evidence is quite strong and they're happening at least uh, in our in our stretch of the world in the public school system. Um, we've had actually at least uh, one public school teacher arrested for child sex crimes every day so far this year. Uh, we've seen the explosion in these identities uh, like genderqueer, pansexual, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, you know, infinite varieties. These are really kind of they spread through the social effect. People are being manipulated, I think, into identifying them. And then, of course, you have kind of cult and general ideological grooming happening uh, at a frequent rate. Uh, and and do, do you think that so in terms of schooling, and I think we have the same problem here, we, we just did a documentary called Groomed about what was going on in school, certainly in terms of the teaching of gender ideology. Do you think that there's it, that it must be, there's no accident that what we're experiencing is uh, uh, one teacher in the US a day being uh, caught up on uh, sexual misconduct charges with children? Are there paedophiles working their way into schools? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think to a certain extent, any large organization or large institution that has access to kids is going to be a natural institution for predators to target. So this is a longstanding problem. It was certainly a problem in the Catholic Church in the early 2000s. That was a huge global scandal and quite rightly so. Um, people needed to be held accountable. People needed to be brought to justice. People needed to be uh, prosecuted, uh, all of which happened. Um, and I think for some reason, public schools have a kind of aura of a uh, halo effect. They have an aura of, uh, of public trust. I'm not sure that that's in all cases deserved. Public schools have actually had a pretty abysmal record of behavior from COVID policies to uh, policies actually covering up uh, sexual misconduct. There's a there's a practice called passing the trash where districts will silently push out teachers and it hasn't been uh, solved. And actually, even the Biden Education Department just issued a report recently saying more has to be done to actually have policies in place to get these predator teachers out. Uh, and then certainly once you've now introduced uh, gender ideology or queer theory, um, things start going a little haywire because you have a group of ideologues. I don't think intent on on abusing kids uh, physically. I, I really don't think that that's the that's the intent. These people are just true believers in the ideology. But the ideology requires you to talk to young pe young children uh, about sex without their parents' knowledge. And anytime you get adults talking to children about sex behind the backs of parents, uh, we should be very worried. We should be waving the bright red flag. Absolutely. Um, so when you talk about the ideology more broadly, are, is, is, and, and what you can be groomed into more broadly, are we, are we talking about the fact that not only do, do we have to um, you know, be deeply inappropriate in the way that we talk to young children about sex, especially in loco parentis when schools' responsibility is, is to protect our children from this sort of stuff, uh, is the, is, does the, the ideology is it also using this opportunity to just turn our children into little comrades or, 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 or little disciples of a particular ideology which uh, is loosely called LGBTQIA++, whatever it is, but it's, it is in itself, or wokeism, or, or it feels very religious in, in some way. Is, is that what schools are doing as well? And, it, and why are parents not resisting it? Well, they are. Yeah, I, I, and I think it's even broader than that. You know, I've been spending, I've spent the last you know, year and a half reporting uh, in American schools, looking at original source documents, working with whistleblowers, studying curricular documents. And some of these are very explicit, whether it's critical race theory or queer theory. They say explicitly in their teaching materials, in their curricular documents, in their district trainings, we are training social activists. We are training revolutionaries. You know, you have videos from Portland public schools where they're you know, training them how to do Black Lives Matter demonstrations in elementary school, training them how to march, training them how to raise the fist in middle school, actually training them how to hit the streets and protest. Um, and the same, uh, uh, the same ideology, whether it's along the line of race or along the line of sex, um, is really widespread, especially in our left-leaning school districts. And they make no bones about it. They say, we've adopted the Paulo Freire neo-Marxist style pedagogy in which students will be trained not just to gain excellence or to gain literacy or to gain skills or to become good citizens, but to be agents of the revolution, agents of social change. And parents uh, revolted against critical race theory. It's now restricted or banned in 17 American states. Parents are now in the process of understanding uh, what's happening on gender, what's happening with queer theory. Um, and so I think we're going to see an analogous process start to play out. And I'm trying to accelerate that as much as I can, doing the reporting, actually substantiating these uh, these really serious charges. You know, I have a uh, I'm in the process of doing a 10 part uh, investigative series looking at curriculum from 10, 10 districts, school districts around the country that are teaching collectively millions of kids um, in really what would be thought of as kind of radical sexual politics. Uh, that has now made its way uh, all the way down to kindergarten. 
That's amazing. Uh, I was watching, uh, last night, I was watching The Revenant for some reason. I don't know why, but I, I just thought I'd watch it. And there's this very strong sense in it, which I hadn't noticed when I watched it the first time, of, of, this, of this original sin of stealing the land from the indigenous people of America. Do you think that what is going on, part of this ideology, is driven by a sense of original sin, of guilt, of, of colonial guilt, if you will, of European settlers coming in? landing and arriving in America. Do you think that's what m might be driving part of it? I think part of it is that. I think that uh, it's a very convenient trope or very convenient lever for people who want to have power over others is to convince them of their guilt or their uh, almost spiritual and historical participation in these crimes against humanity. So it, it's a very powerful lever. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, the treatment of the Native Americans in the early colonial period or it's uh, the slavery system. Obviously, everyone opposes uh, uh, human slavery. Uh, and, and yet people are convinced that they are somehow uh, uh, should be held accountable or should be feeling guilty for those uh, historical events that, you know, may or may not even been committed by their ancestors. Right. You know, uh, uh, and, and but. While there is a argument, I think a very strong argument and an obvious argument that would get 99% agreement is, hey, look, every country should look back in its history, should see where that country has committed injustices, and then seek to rectify them or seek to atone for them or seek to improve uh, uh, from that earlier uh, historical condition. Um, what they've done is they're using it as a method to manipulate individuals and a method to manipulate individual kids. And so I've seen, for example, in, 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 both, in, in both race and sex, again, curriculum documents in large public school districts like Los Angeles or Philadelphia um, or Portland or, or San Diego, where they're saying um, you should feel uh, guilty for and atone for your white privilege, but you should also feel guilty and atone for your heterosexual privilege and your cisgender privilege. So they take the whole theoretical apparatus, privilege theory, as one example. And then they try to crank you on race, sexual orientation, gender identity, any leverage point they can get, they kind of bring in that, that fundamental Marxist or neo-Marxist uh, narrative and those really cult uh, brainwashing techniques um, that you see littered through the curriculum documents in a lot of these districts. But the, the irony surely is that um, slave owners in America would have been the elite back in the day. They would have been the 1%. They would have been the, the people that are now uh, using their enormous tech corporations to, to tell us about how privileged we are. Whereas the majority, 99% of uh, you know white-skinned American people or, or any other skinned American people for that matter, would not have uh, had the privilege of um, or, or be part of the, the cultural appallingness of slavery. So that, that seems to, be, to, to not make sense. I, I don't understand why people can't apply rational logic to this. Why, why this, what, yeah, what, what, why, what, why won't people acknowledge that it, it, it was exactly that elite class that are the thing that they're accusing the working class and the middle class of? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that it's incoherent logically. So certainly, you can do a class analysis and say, well, if you if you accept, and I'm not sure it's true, but if you accept that it's a kind of contiguous uh, class across time, um, then it would it would kind of absolve the working classes uh, uh, of that uh, guilt or responsibility. The other thing is, you know, a lot of Americans, including you know, you know, my father came in the 1960s, uh, you know. A uh, 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 hundred years after the end of slavery seems kind of odd to hold him responsible. He didn't. He didn't do anything wrong. His ancestors didn't do anything wrong. He's a latecomer to the to the party in America. Um, and then, of course, people in the in the North, where they were, you know, free states, very early on, immediately after the formation of the Constitution and the and the Union. Um, and so you could, in theory, say, okay, if you're a direct descendant of of, of a slave owner. Um, do you have some responsibility? Do you have some guilt? Do you have some uh, uh, requirement? Um, maybe. I mean, you could make an argument for that, but it becomes very difficult uh, uh, to say, uh, you know, through the accident of your birth, um, you bear collective historical guilt based on your bloodline. Um, I, I think most people in there are certain societies that believe in that 
course, a caste system style uh, 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 societies. But in the West, one of the things that I think is good, one of the things that's great about uh, uh, kind of the modern West is we've tended to try to downplay uh, 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 birth and inheritance. And in fact, the founders were seeking to elevate people from the lower classes who had the most capability. And so since that time, we've we've tried to say, you know, we're not going to do hereditary blood guilt in the society. We're going to try to move away from that more primitive and more destructive and more restrictive social practice. And yet it's kind of coming back with a vengeance because it's useful for promoting and, 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 and spreading a left wing ideology. And it seems to be uh, amazingly, it seems to be all across the most decadent parts of of the West. So we in the UK have imported all of this stuff from America, a, a lot of it which is completely irrelevant to our culture. Do you think it's symptomatic of of, as I said at the beginning, of a, de- a decline of the West, or, an, or or the the West going through? Uh, I think what did. Um, what was it called? The, the fourth age, you know, strong men make good times, that thing. Did you think we're in a weak man make bad times phase of society? It's, yeah, it, it, it's certainly possible. Um, but all of the great civilizations have gone through these, these kind of periodic moments of civilizational self-doubt. And in his study of the Roman Empire, Machiavelli has some insight into this, where he's looking at the history of Rome and he says... You know, there were decadent periods in Rome. There were periods that were the, the, the civilization was in decline. But he, he really thinks that two things can bring about uh, the restoration or the renewal of those civilizations. You know, one is actually getting great leadership. So having a, a great man in a position of leadership uh, in, in the Roman Republic, obviously, those, those, those great men were elected by a small council of their peers. In our democracy, uh, it's, they're elected by a, a, a large council of their peers. Um, but the same principle holds. You can have a great leadership uh, that can start to remind people of where the civilization is going and, and start to repair it. And the other thing that he said that is quite relevant to us today as well is uh, civilizations renew themselves by going back to their foundings. So remembering why they exist in the first place, remembering the heroic men who started the trajectory of those civilizations at the beginning and trying to reinterpret and re-understand and reform or even reclaim uh, the values and principles that 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 were that were essential to the founding, that are the the lifeblood of the civilization. And I think that we have to do that. And I think we have to do that, especially in schools. We have to teach kids: you are born into this civilization. This is what the civilization stands for. This is why it's good. These are its highest principles. Here are the ways that we fell short. Here are the ways that we've uh, not lived up to those expectations. But here are the ways to get through it, to, to, to bring that up to another a higher level. And I think if we could do that, we're in good shape. And I suppose the opposing argument to that would be that you're anti-progress, that you're, 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 you're looking backwards, that you're, you refuse to accept that, uh, you know, people can be trans, uh, you know, transhuman, transracial, transsexual, trans everything. Uh, and, and that why wouldn't you just allow someone to be whoever they wanted to be at, at, at any point and not to look back on people who died in wars that could, were, were needless. And if everyone was kinder to each other, we'd, we'd maybe get on if i ask you to defend the the other side of the argument the thing that we i think we probably agree on in in our in our uh, uh, strong opposition what what defense would you have for the for the ideology that is currently consuming us i think the argument and maybe the strongest argument that they make um is you know always looking back at the historical past as as a succession of oppressions restrictions, domination, the exercise of unjust power. And this is actually true to a certain extent everywhere, right? His, transhistorically, um, it's true in every society. And, and so the, the, the woke, the left wing, has some legitimate basis in examining the historical record, uh, it, which is not perfect. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's filled with human tragedy. It's filled with exploitation. This is, of course, true. And so they have a a legitimate historical basis to make their claims. The problem that they run into is then, well, where do you go from there? Because if you treat history not as a source of 
knowledge and sustenance and nourishment, but as a source of, uh, from which to flee, which from, uh, from which to, to escape, um, you're going to be disconnected from that continuity. And so I think when they have a legitimate, let's say, historical basis for the argument, the, the conclusions of those arguments are, are oftentimes uh, so uh, uh, detached from uh, historical reality, from, from a sense of continuity, a sense of tradition and principles, that it becomes this kind of absurd, solipsistic, narcissistic identity game where, you know, I can, it, it comes kind of incoherent. Uh, I can solve the problem of past oppression by adopting a uh, sexual identity, for example, that was invented 15 minutes ago. And then I'm going to lay the basis of my whole political ideology on a fundamentally unstable uh, sense of, of, of identity that could be really changed or evaporated as fashions change. And so I think that the responsible way to bring together these arguments to say, hey, we acknowledge that our opponents have some good points is to say, let's come to a con agreement on historical wrongs. Let's really investigate it and take it seriously. But let's also look at the historical rights. Let's look at the things that were, were, were done uh, 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 towards progress, towards success, towards greatness in our country. And then let's come to a rational understanding based on that comprehensive and really complex or, 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 or sophisticated view of history, and then try to come up with a solution that, that actually matches the problem. Um, in an ideal world, again, could we have dialogue with them? Yes, perhaps. Uh, although I'm not sure that it happens uh, in, in, in practice too often. Well, it seems the, the worrying, the bit that worries me is it seems to be exponential. You know, we've gone uh, in a couple of years from critical race theory uh, being, you know, starting to become very, uh, you know, a very hot topic and understood by parents, especially during the pandemic, as they started to see what was going on in the classrooms. Then we've gone to gender ideology. This is being taught to my, we have a, an organisation in England, which I think you've been tweeting, you've shared the tweets about, called Stonewall, which is saying that two-year-olds can tr uh, understand their, their, their gender identity. But we seem to have gone from critical race theory to what is a woman, to two-year-olds could be trans in a very, very short period of time. And the half-life of this ideology seems to be getting shorter and shorter and shorter rather than longer and longer and longer. So uh, as much as I uh, would be optimistic about having a conversation, I mean, is this the end of the firework, the most vehement part of the argument finally coming to the end? Uh, and and are, are there going to be some people, because you've got the midterms coming in, in November, and as far as I can see, the Democrats are in real, real trouble if they're going to be driven by this uh, this woke ideology. Are we seeing the end of it? Are we going to start seeing some more sensible, traditionally democratic policies coming out again? It's a hard. It, I don't know. It, it's a very hard question to answer. You would you would think that yes. The problem, though, for the left, in, and and I've seen this from the inside. I mean, I've really you know studied it and reported on it and 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 know the players. The problem with the left is that they're, most of their congressional representatives, for example, are from urban and suburban districts. They're relatively moderate Democrats. You have a lot of, kind of uh, you know, Bill Clinton style Democrats um, where they're kind of moderate and sensible as far as their policy priorities. But the problem is that the entire left wing activist infrastructure is very left wing. It's very young. It's very loud. It's very connected to the internet, to the new communications infrastructure. And they always put pressure, and they do this quite brilliantly, they put pressure on their own people. And so they've been able to shift that center, uh, actually much to the left of even their own congressional representatives. So the discourse is outflanking the left to the left. And I don't know if those folks are willing to budge because, yeah, a, a, a swing district congressman or or a uh, member of parliament, uh, they have to win votes. Uh, they have to say, well, you know, I don't want to get too far out in front of my own voters or else I'm going to get booted because it's a close district. But the activist organizations get paid by their benefactors no matter what the votes turn out. And so they're incentivized to keep their job through catastrophe, through uh, pushing to the extreme, through outdoing one another in the competition of who can be most pure ideologically. 
And so you have these two things. You have a political system and an activist system that are right now at odds in the left. And so the question is, who will uh, prevail in an intra-left struggle? Do the politicians have enough to kind of beat back the activists uh, you know, with a stick and say, you know what, let the adults get back in charge here? Or do the activists have enough to say, win or lose, we're going to keep pushing you guys harder? Because the, the, the rationalization is, we lost not because we were too liberal, but because we weren't liberal enough. And so I don't know the answer to that question, but if I had to guess, um, I would say that the, the uh, political situation shifts dramatically to the right, while the activist ideology holds somewhat steady over the short and medium term. So you were talking about leaders. I, it is in my view, and I think the view of anyone in England who takes an interest in American politics, that a couple of states decided to stand tall, especially during COVID and especially during, um, you know, the ins ensuring stuff, as you talked about, in terms of critical race theory and what our kids are being taught in school and the values of, the, of remembering what this uh, great union of states was all about and one of those seems to be ron DeSantis. now what do, what are your feelings on him as a man and, and wh why did he stand against uh the the prevailing orthodoxy in america that was going against him and what and what empowered him for an english audience you see we we don't have that system so if one of our little states decided we don't want to play ball with the COVID mandates or, or the shutting down of school or the masking of children. We don't have that option, but you do in, in America. And, and why did DeSantis do it? And has he saved, essentially, America in a lot of ways? Yeah, I, I, well, first off, as a, as a, as a general point, I, I'm tremendously impressed with Governor DeSantis. I've had actually the honor and privilege of working with him on critical race theory, working with him in his fight against Disney. Uh, I spent a lot of personal time with him and, and had a chance to talk to him and really try to get an understanding of how he operates, how he thinks, what his priorities are. And the, 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 the two takeaways that I think are most important in understanding Governor DeSantis is that um, he is I I extraordinarily intelligent and also has an interest in policy, which, which bizarrely is actually not universal among politicians. Many politicians don't care about policy. DeSantis has a kind of an encyclopedic mind when it comes to policy. And so his advisors were saying and joking to me and said, you know, during COVID, I'd get a call from the governor at 2 a.m. And the governor would be saying, hey, I'm just reading this paper in New England Journal of Medicine. Can you get me the doctor who wrote it on the phone? Uh, and well, governor, it's 2 a.m. We can't get him on the phone now, but we'll get him on the phone at you know 8 a.m. the next morning. And so... And look, critical race theory, university reform, all these things, he actually studies these problems deeply, which gives him a sense of uh, confidence in, in directing policy. Uh, on COVID, he knew the science better than any other governor, any other politician in the country, I think, without a doubt. And so he could make more confident assessments that appeared risky at the time, but in his mind were actually uh, the stronger uh, play because he was so interested in policy. The second thing, and this is also a requirement, a lot of people are very smart, a lot of people are interested in policy. He's got an enormous amount of courage. And he was able to stand in the breach and say, we're not going to shut down our state. He was able to stand in the breach saying, we're not going to teach gender ideology in grades K through three at all. It's now banned. He was in the breach saying, we're not going to teach CRT anywhere in our public school system and drew tremendous heat from the media. But what he did in all those cases is he stood tough with a, with a, a kind of immovable com confidence. And then once he got through it, the public looked around. They did the polling and said, oh, DeSantis has 70, 30 public support behind him. And so he has the fortitude to get through that period of the media scrum. And, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, what gives you the, 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 the confidence and the courage to make these bold calls, very controversial calls? And he said something along the lines of, Chris, you know, you get one shot at this. So I'm going to do the right thing and we'll let the chips fall where they may. And of course, yeah, that's a little bravado. I'm sure that he calculates as any politician does and any politician should. But you get the sense that he has a high risk tolerance and he's going to stand in the breach, do the right thing with confidence that he's making the right call um, uh, and not back down. And I think that's what we need. Um, I think that's the kind of attitude, the kind of personality, the kind of spirit that we're going to need 
to fight some of these very complex challenges. Yeah, he, I, he, I agree with you completely. He comes across to me as an extremely principled man. So I, it's like he can speak to everybody because what he's saying is, is, is based on principle. So it's, it's simple. Anyone can take it on board. It's this is what I believe. And if you can, you back me or you don't back me. And it's great to see how he's, how he's going. Do you think there's going to be a problem come? Because, um, I mean, he, he seems so ob very obviously a uh, future presidential candidate. Do you think he's going to sit out the next one if Trump stands, or do you think he would he would go into the primaries with Trump? This is complicated, and you know I have my uh, my friends and contacts in 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 Trump world and DeSantis world, and uh, you know it, 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 I don't know. I mean I I, I hope that. Um, I hope that it's not a kind of internal bloodletting process in the primary. I hope that some people that have uh, that are working on this at a, at a kind of per, a kind of man to principle to principle level um, can work something out where uh, where we get a good candidate in 2024 that has the support of everyone that's united. Um, so we'll see what happens. You know, I, 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 I kind of my position and, and uh, uh, maybe it's a hedge, but I, I, it's 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 authentic. It's my real position is. I, I like DeSantis. I wish he would run for president. I think now's his time. I think he has what it takes. I think he could take this country uh, in, towards a, a fundamentally new and, and better direction. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I support the governor. Um, but if the primary happens and then Trump is nominated, I would be more than happy to, 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 to cast my ballot for Trump in the general because, you know, D despite his uh, you know, character quirks and, and, and flaws, and despite some of the drama that he uh, found himself in through his term, uh, he did advance good policy. And look, whatever you think about Trump the man, Trump the personality, Trump the, the collection of psychological traits, um, from my point of view, as someone who loves policy, as someone who is, cares about policy, it's a very practical choice. Who is going to move policy in the right direction and who is not? Whether it's Biden or Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg, whoever, Gavin Newsom, the, the psychopath from California, um, they're going to put it in the wrong direction. So I'm lining up for the ones who are who are on the other side. Absolutely. Do you um, do you follow British politics much? Are you, are you interested in it or is a, it, a little is bit? It... I do. Yeah. I like to see the question time uh, on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do, who? Um, what, what, what's your sort of your overall take on what's going on in Britain at the moment. Do you think that the world still looks to Britain or, or do, do you think we still have an important place, a uh, role to play in the world? I think, I think absolutely yes. Um, and I think in fact, uh, I, I, I've tried to learn a lot from our, my you know, British friends and colleagues because in some ways you guys are ahead of the game compared to where we are as Americans. I think that the anti-gender ideology movement in the UK is much more well-developed, has a much uh, stronger track record of success than, than it has in the US, where it's still in this beginning germinating stage. Um, I also think that, uh, you, you know, I, I caught, uh, uh, Kemi Badenoch uh, caught my eye, I think last year, um, when she was talking about critical race theory, she did a speech that I tweeted out over time. Uh, I was very encouraged to see that she was really in the running uh, uh, to, to, to get that top slot. I think that it speaks to um, the power of that issue, the power of the narrative that she's, uh, she's built. Um, that is really in our, in, our, in our country is only analogous. We have kind of a, 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 an intellectual movement, um, but really not a political movement on that level as far as anti-CRT figures, especially from the black community. Um, and then I think that uh, as a matter of policy, you know, I, I know Eric Kaufman, professor at uh, Birkbeck University, is a colleague of mine, and I've talked with him in many cases. Um, there is a sense that the, the policy is moving forward um, slowly but surely in the UK. And so I, I actually think it's very important that we uh, uh, work together across, you know, this kind of transatlantic partnership. To learn from one another, and because look, we're, we're gonna we're gonna stand or fall together uh, at the end of the day, and the more that we can learn from one another, the more that we can kind of trade notes and trade uh, policies and 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 create these uh, alliances, I think it's enormously powerful. And uh, our opposition is international, it, at least in the West. It's kind of an international movement in the West, and so 
we should have that same kind of movement. And even though we have different governing systems, obviously, um, our, our constitution is different than the, the, the system in, in the UK, we, we share a common culture. And that's what this is really all about. This is a cultural fight. And I think we need to fight it together. I agree 100% with you. Kemi Badnock was, uh, for, she was not great on the vaccine mandates and, uh, sorry, vaccine passports and things like that, but she understood the cultural issue. And, and I, I agree with you in a lot of ways that, they, you know, there's ebbs and flows within, within the West, but the most important thing is you don't have a nation, you don't have, a, you don't, you don't have anything unless you have a shared culture. And I think she was the one that fought the hardest for it. And um, I think it was a, a shame. I actually think it was a stitch up that they that the MPs voted uh, tactically to stop her getting into the last two because I think she would have won mm. on the back on the back of the membership of British Conservatives by a country mile. There we go, Chris. It is been an absolute pleasure getting your insights into these things i have huge respect for you for all that you do to to raise these issues and um i encourage everyone to follow you and support you and everyone in england to learn from you so thank you thank for you what so you do. much it's great to, great to speak with you cheers